Labs. Our speakers today, joining Tan Sri, are Dr. Kala Nithi Nesaratnam, co-founder Climate Governance Malaysia, who is also the independent director on the IOI and Tanjong Motors boards, and Michelle Kai Lim, president and CEO of the Institute of Corporate Directors Malaysia, who has been instrumental in building capacity among directors here in the country. So now to start off our discussion, I'd like all of you to take out your phones, not to text your friends, please, but to please uh, scan this QR code for this question that we would like to ask you to kick us off. And the question is, which do you think is more influential in directing organizations towards the just transition? And is it the board or is it senior management? You can see the live polling results. We decided to ask this question as a start because really governance is a very key issue when it comes to the equitable transition. And Tan Sri, you had mentioned about political leadership. And I can say, you know, one of the reflections I had from the ASEAN meetings in the last week really was there's a lot of talk and sometimes no action. And the leaders very much, you know, speak in rhetoric. But what exactly are the specific actions and frameworks that they are bringing to the table. And I think that the private sector is actually getting impatient. And the role of the boards are so important because they have realized that if they sit by thing and wait for legislation, then really we would be waiting for a long time for things to happen. And so we're focusing on the boards here because they are the stewards of good governance for any organization and they play a critical role in helping organizations navigate the growing array of regulations, everything from geopolitics to sustainability risks in this new and disrupted world order. And we've heard from Tan Sri how directors have a fiduciary duty to guide their companies competently through this transformation. I happen to serve on two listed Singapore boards as well, and I have witnessed how boards really struggle with the, a wide array of issues that really require their urgent attention. Everything from business performance, top line, bottom line growth, governance, operations, ESG performance, cybersecurity, digitalization, so on and so forth. And then on top of that, we've seen the rise of shareholder activism as well. And we've seen that some directors are being voted out of the boards because of inaction. So it really is not easy to be on the board or on management these days. But that was a trick question because the answer is actually both. So I think I just want to, you know, kind of deep dive into this conversation by starting with Dr. Kala. You've just come, you know, from the Climate Governance Summit, which has been hosted this entire week. Um, so I would love to hear from you, what does the equitable transition mean to you? And how have you seen that play out at your summit and across board in the country? Thank you so much, um, Jessica, for that question, and uh, good afternoon, um, everyone. So, for those of you who heard me yesterday, I'm sorry if I'm repeating myself, but let me start with, um, I had this conversation with uh, the head of engineering of a multinational company, and, uh, you know, he's under pressure to decarbonize. Of course, you know, the headquarters really, you know, um, coming hard on him. So he said he's done as much as he can. He's decarbonized as much as he can. And I said, so what are you going to do for the rest of it? So he said, I'm going to set up LSS because, you know, with our net R now, we can now sell even our renewable energy across border, Singapore, you know, wherever else. So he said, I'm going to set up LSS and that will be the carbon offset. I said, wonderful, but you know, is it um, because you know you need large areas of uh, land? So is it you know uh, virgin land? Is it communities there that are going to be affected? Uh, what really are you? He said that's not my problem. I'm going to leave that to the sustainability division to handle. So, ladies and gentlemen, this is what we mean by a just transition that you really have to look at what you're doing, who, who are you going to be affecting, you know, the, there's so many things happening in Malaysia today. Gua Musang, they're going to min, mine minerals because batteries uh, are, you know, um, needed, right, for EV and your solar and all that. So the thing to ask is, 
who are you hurting in Gua Musang, you know, when you go and mine uh, minerals for batteries and all that. So that's one side of it. The other side of it is in Europe, they started um, renewable energy way back in 2005. And, you know, they phased out coal miners slowly, but they set up funds, just transition funds to help these coal miners to reskill them to do renewable energy. So these are the things that we have to think about when we transition to renewable energy. But the thing is, at the board level, are we even discussing it? No, it's civil society that's, you know, for the last, last year, in fact, my brother is a just transition expert. So he's flying around the world talking and he's even advising World Bank on the funding for just transition. So he tells me that, you know, it's only civil society that's talking about it now. At the board, we are just grappling with net zero targets and what we must do. And yesterday I said, you know, we are in the era of global boiling. We have to start action now. In fact, Niloy Banerjee, UNDP boss, he said, you know, our first day climate governance summit was so optimistic with, you know, YB Nick Nasby saying he, we are doing this, this energy conservation act, blah, blah, blah. But he said, you know, he's so pessimistic. He said the action, you know, chaos in parliament, changing governments, policies change. Where are we? You know, and net zero to 2050 is just too far down the road. We need to act now. Thank you, Jessica. Thank you so much, Dr. Kala. I think that you made some really good points there. And it's precisely because sometimes politics is a mess need the private sector, the philanthropic sector, the public, when the civil society to actually step up and engender action. Yeah, and Jessica, just to, maybe yeah. I'll talk later about why the private sector is doing what we are doing yeah, later. Yeah, sure, sure. I would like to pick up on that. But I want to turn to Michelle. Um, ITDM obviously, you know, launched a series of programs for directors on sustainability issues. Um, I would like to hear from you what is the level of understanding and application of board directors these days on this issue and how do they balance that with other priorities as well? Hi, um, good afternoon and thank you again Jessica for having uh, myself and ICDM represented here. Um, as m some of you may know, perhaps we've recently uh, uh, started the second mandatory uh, program for PLCs, public listed companies in Malaysia, both on the main market and ACE market. That started in August uh, last month. We've run three uh, uh, iterations so far. Now this is uh, the mandatory accreditation program two, leading for impact, we call it LIP, purely on sustainability. Yeah, and you know, if I can, can, can give an example of a classroom of about 70 that are board uh, members there, a mix of companies, probably about two thirds really know nothing um, about a third probably are somewhere on their journey, some perhaps quite fairly mature, I would say. So that it gives you a certain understanding of where we are. Even when we, f when we first curated the program, if I could read some stats, some areas that directors found challenging in terms of sustainability governance, 76% found that challenging. Performance target measurement, 70% found that challenging. Materiality assessment, stakeholder management, 68%. Reporting and disclosure, 64%. Right? Common sustainability matters that they need more guidance. Emissions, water, energy, waste, supply chain, data privacy, all the areas we're all talking about and concerned with. Other areas that need more guidance, suppliers, your, your supply chain, consumer health and safety, biodiversity, human rights, supplier social assessment materials, it's all there. And everyone's being very frank, and I think to be honest, Jessica, they do realize it, but no one realizes how bad it is, how urgent it is, how much they need to do. So the program actually does address that, um, but really to be effective, it's got to be internalized. It's not a disclosure-based thing. Disclosure is really at the end of it. You've got to have internalized it, integrated it into your business, and then report on it. So integration, I think, is one of the bigger issues, obviously, and, and reading, you know, you can see from all the responses as well. But uh, they do recognize. They do recognize how important it is. Um, it's just uh, many of them need help. Of course, the disclosure requirements you know, shock them all into reality of what they need to do. But sometimes you'd be surprised. You're probably already doing it, but when you need to measure it, you realize how far off you are or perhaps how much you've done you know, and how much you've achieved. Yeah. 
Those are really good insights, Michelle. And actually, on your panel yesterday at CG, I was really amused when one of them said, um, the problem with Malaysia boards is that they rely too much on consultants and they think consultants will help them solve the problem. And it came from a consultant. So I was really quite amazed that there was that level of self-awareness. Yes. <laughs> but, but my question to you then is how do we accelerate the capacity building that we need? Because obviously you're saying that the awareness is there, directors know that they need to act. Um, but how do they get the required skill sets? You know, and I've been, I guess, privileged or unprivileged to have worked in this for 20 years. And I'm you know, still learning every day. And, and the application of that is still so much evolving. So how is ICDM helping the landscape? Yeah, I mean, obviously, LIP is one way, right, the program. Um, but you know, sometimes, if you can't change uh, their mindsets, you need to change them. So having board refreshment as well is critical. I wouldn't say putting one person who has sustainability skill sets on the board is the answer. That's not the solution. Everyone needs to know because you can't have proper oversight unless you know yourself, right? Um, so obviously, uh, composition of the board is very important. Refreshment of the board, yeah. Um, the board themselves, obviously, having the required knowledge in terms of climate, in terms of nature, in terms of their impact on society, and how that actually coexists, right? Your, your financial health and societal health actually goes hand in hand, right? Um, and, there's, and, and, and all your stakeholders are going to judge you by that. You know, your stakeholders are, are voting with their feet, you know. So um, they are waking up to that. Regulation obviously helps. Um, you know, uh, uh, having national policy obviously helps, but you need to be aligned with that as well. Getting capability also one step down at your management level is very, very important, and that you work together, right? So board has oversight, your management actually are going to effect and, and implement all your strategies. So have that strategy in mind. Look long term, not short term. Make sure you're looking long term. Um, and, uh, you know, end of the day, you know, having, having, being agile enough to know that you may not know everything, you know, there's lots more that you need to know, there's a lot more that you need to do, but just opening up your mind and being agile and, and, and understanding that there's a lot that you don't know and then you need to learn. I think learning is something we, we all never stop and, and, and boards as well need to keep learning. I know, sorry, I'll have to go on about this, but, you know, innovation, capital, all of that as well is, is areas that all boards need to look at now in terms of the just transition. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, can I yes. just add on, Jessica? I think we have no excuse. I mean, how many of you are directors of boards here? I see some, I know. Okay, <laughs> fantastic. So I think, you know, yesterday I was discussing the eight principles of, for, for board directors. And this is a World Economic Forum because CGM is a World Economic Forum initiative. And a principle two um, is command of the subject. I chair the board sustainability committee at IOI. And I sit there, you know, with the CSO discussing our net zero targets. And so strategies need to be built. And, you know, you yourself need to understand the task force on financial, uh, climate financial disclosures, DCFD, task force on climate financial disclosures, correct? Otherwise, how are you going to ask the hard questions to your CS, so you yourself don't understand it, and then you've got to go and ask your you know, management about it. So I actually went and upskilled myself. I sat uh, two years ago for the Oxford University Sustainability Corporation Program, a su sustainability program for corporations. It's amazing because your case study is your own organization and they help you, you know, uh, do better on, on the last uh, uh, not the last, uh, it's six weeks, on the last week, you are actually trying to help your own organization get better. So upskilling is so important. When I joined a, a recent board, um, I had the first thing I had to do was sit for an integrity uh, test, anti-bribery anti and integrity test. I thought I knew everything about corruption. You know, it's black or white, correct? No gray, right? So, Kala, go and sit for the test, no problem. And they said I have to get 80%. They send me some videos and reading material. I said, I don't need all this. I know corruption. So, I started the test and then I said, hmm, I didn't know it. The intricacies of Section 17A, guys, you need to know how it affects your corporation. So I went and 
went back and listened to the video and you know read the material and then got 100 percent yay <laughs> but this is what i'm saying you think you know it also but there are lots and co lots of courses out there that you know as directors you should uh, upskill otherwise you're going to be in a situation where you don't understand your fellow directors are clueless as well and then you're supposed to tell management what to do Thank you. Very well said, Carla. And I'd like to put a plug here that Eco Business offers director training yeah. on all the sustainability <laughs> topics you've mentioned. Um, but jokes aside, I want to come to Tanshri. Tanshri, you know, you have talked about 35 years you've been at negotiations and seeing things happen. Um, ASEAN meetings, UNFCCC, we've seen a lot of negotiations. But the scientists have actually called out that the pace has been really, really slow. And we are seeing the climate change impacts every single day you see that in the news. And we are living in an era where I think a lot of people feel a lot of anxiety. So how can we even begin to craft national strategies that balance priorities and execute them so that we are not, uh, you know, we are addressing the loss of jobs, for example, because some political factions in the US, you know, they've used the loss of jobs as an excuse for inaction. And I think that the politics of this is quite dangerous. So we'd love to hear your perspective. That's, <clears throat> that's a question fit for a PhD <laughs> degree, you know. Uh, but really, the question when you said the scientists were quite exasperated, that's quite true. But things are looking up. For an example, on climate change, the element that makes a difference is the IPCC. This is the Intergovernmental Panel on uh, Climate Change. Uh, these are the guys who try to link up to the politician. This is what we call this area of science or knowledge policy nexus. So there needs to be a dialogue between the uh, knowledge generators uh, with the uh, policy makers. Secondly, uh, the uh, scientific community must be able to transmit those message in language that the recipient would uh, understand. Uh, that is the problem sometimes because the scientists talk down to the politician and policy makers. And quite a number of these policy makers and politicians, they're very, very smart people, really. Uh, you need to make sense. So at the end of the day, I just want to uh, cite one experience. I work for uh, the one of the prime ministers of this country several years ago. And one day he called me up and he said, I don't really mind the kind of science that you want to advise me. It's okay, I'll try to understand. But he said, I need from you two things. Can your advice create jobs, jobs and jobs for the rakyat? Secondly, can you bring up, can that advice eventually impact on bring up the uh, the socio-economic uh, status of the people. So you see here, the, that thing has a very practical uh, impact, right? Creation of jobs and also uh, being more uh, prosperous. Uh, that's what it is. So uh, this is uh, lacking. But coming back to this particular group here, the corporate sector, which you all are having, I think you have a very key job, and it bothers me when you said the, uh, what the CEO was saying, uh, it's not really bothered about sustainability, isn't it? Uh, this needs to change, really. But how do you change it? Uh, it's, it's quite difficult, but I think it's doable. If you look at, at history, you know, uh, things can, can, can be changed. Uh, third one, I think uh, it needs to be mainstream. It need to be, uh, uh, we need to be connected with uh, the people, you know. Uh, maybe that would start from school, uh, the ways and means of uh, behaving. 
Again, here I cite one uh, personal story. Uh, I used to live in Japan for nearly 10 years. My children were schooling in Japan. They are half Japanese. So during the summer break, we went to a McDonald's uh, in Kuala Lumpur. And after eating, the table that we used to sit were cleaner than when it was before we arrived. That was during the first year of us returning home. But now my kids are all Malaysianized. They go to McDonald's, they left those things there and walk away, you know. So uh, these are the kind of things that uh, we need to, to inculcate. Yeah. Thank you so much for that anecdote. And culture um, mindset, that is so important for any corporate organization, right? And I think that that is, is such an important point to make. I'm going to come to our guest soon for some questions, so I'm just preparing you for that opportunity. Um, but I want to touch on something that you had mentioned, right? And there was uh, climate litigation you mentioned in your slides, Tan Shui. And there's also um, uh, the shareholder activism that, that's on the rise. And so we've seen how the likes of Exxon, Shell, they've been subjected to civil suits. Cargill recently got sued by Client Earth. We've had an uh, Australian student sue the government over the Australian government bonds and they've now had to mention climate risk in their bonds to accurately convey that. The FT ran a story two weeks ago about how investors are extremely undervaluing climate risk in all their assets and we are facing what they call um, you know a, a, what like an Asian financial crisis like moment where you get a massive underwriting of assets. So as bought directors, or, you know, boards or senior management, this is a very real possibility. You are facing litigation, you're facing being voted off. How do you even begin to safeguard your organization against these? So, um, climate risks, you know, it's, you don't have to single that out. I think we, we have all kinds of risks, right? Financial risk, we know our fiduciary duty to that because that's the first thing when we attended the mandatory accreditation program, we were told that Okay, guys, like the Bursa's uh, uh, legal counsel told us that, you know, you're liable for financial risk. And then today, uh, last year, um, Tansri Zarina Anwa, you know, um, chairman of ICDM, and Topon Janet Ui, she's the uh, um, partner at Screen, they came up with a 54-page legal opinion on, uh, you know, director's duties to climate. And uh, the... Um, Good news is that under common law, we are liable, okay? So it's not only a financial risk, now you're also liable to climate risk, so a lot of pressure on directors. So litigation cases, I think yesterday I mentioned, Jessica, there are over 2,000, and most of it, 1,500, I think, in the United States, and people are also like, you know, um, client uh, doing uh, directors uh, of Shell, uh, Exxon Mobil, um, you know, voted against the re-election of uh, three independent directors, including uh, our own Tansri One, because they said they wanted people with different mindsets, you know, want people thinking differently, not from the fossil fuel industry. And then you've got people being hauled up for greenwashing, Deutsche Bank uh, in Germany last year. The CSO unfortunately left, and uh, so please be nice to your CSO because they left. And then, you know, uh, the red flag was that everything in the annual report wasn't true. And <laughs> so, I mean, these are the things you're going to be facing now, but... We've got our own Taman Sri Muda in Shalom who've already initiated a suit. Yeah. Yes. It may not be against companies, but it's against the government. Government. Yeah. So this is what's happening now. So I always say that, you know, uh, greenwashing, be, please be careful. Maybe in Malaysia we can't spell enforcement yet but maybe it's coming <laughs> so really so many things to worry us about so you know start slowly get your act together for us uh, jessica if you don't mind i think for businesses uh, we are under pressure from investors we want to attract the best investors so we have so many esg ratings we have FTSE for good bursa we have msci we have sustain analytics we have CDP, we have 
you know, sport, and then I'm always challenging my management, you know, how do we get from, you know, B to A or C to B? You know, we want to attract the best investors, right? And then you get Larry Fink sending us love letters every year, you know, you must be green, you know, ESG, otherwise, you know, we're not going to invest in your company. This year, he's very silent. No more, no more ESG now. Yeah, because why? Because, you know, I, I told everybody yesterday, go and read Tariq Fancy. Tariq Fancy used to work for Larry Fink, and then he tells you why, you know, e, uh, ESG is not important anymore. And of course, you know, the Republican states in the US have pulled out support. So all this is political, but at the same time, you know, we want to do better. You know, we are trading internationally, we want to do better. So, you know, we're always wanting the best ESG rating. So that's investors. Then the regulators are breathing down our neck. Now, because we are internationally competing, we have to do double materiality. We have to conform to the European standards, CSR. So much going on, you know, and then the consumers, you know, they, they are putting pressure. Okay, palm oil sector, you know, we've had 40 years of sustainability on our heads. Uh, then we have uh, people not wanting to work for you because you're not green. Uh, consumer pressure, NGO pressure, so many things happening that, you know, you really need to be on your toes. So the best news for us as an organization was when I heard my CEO said, we will do the right thing even when people are not looking. Ladies and gentlemen, that's really the essence of practicing ESG and good governance. Thanks, Jessica. Very well said, Carla. Thank you. And actually, that reminds me of a story that we ran. Uh, we actually analysed Larry Fink's letters over the years since he started till today and the evolution of ESG has been so interesting in his letters you know he was a champion and advocate then he got you know kind of attacked and watered down and now he's just so scared to say anything and that's really sad reality of our world today I mean of US politics for sure but luckily we're not in the US yeah. so um, you know I think that it's a constructive debate that we need to have yeah. and and you're, you're so right when you said that we need to be doing the right thing even when we're not looking mm -hmm. um, and the other thing that I picked up as well was was on regulation I know SC is in the room so you know on greenwashing and that's something that I think a lot of regulators are sitting up and really looking at I know the MAS in Singapore certainly are and they have a very very strict criteria now a sustainable finance taxonomy that absolutely labels um, you know, finance, what it is, you know, whether it's transition or green bonds, but you're not using that term so that people in the public, they can have faith and trust in these terms. The, the writing is on the wall and uh, you, you have seen it with what happened to Sam Dabi one time, yeah, and it's coming more. Um, but so, so we have to be prepared for it, you know, we have to be prepared for it. It's, it's coming. Yeah. Uh, okay, yeah. Thank you. Anyone wants to add? Investor pressure, have you seen that on, your, on the boards that you said? Um, not really. I mean, the thing is, you know, um, like I've said, the investors haven't, like, you know, if I asked Melissa just now, are they starting to talk about just transition? Because we haven't seen that yet. We haven't had, you know, investors coming and say, you know, are you looking at just transition? No, that hasn't happened yet. But, uh, like, you know, like I said, they have told us, you know, with, because ESG rating is an independent audit of our business practice, right? So we are always challenging ourselves to do better. So with that, you know, we are hoping that, you know, the investors will come because, you know, we've ticked all the boxes, you know, but there are things that they check on, check, check on us, meaning, hey, why is there no, um, you know, um, a board committee looking at, uh, oversight on diversity. So these are the things that suddenly they, you know, tell us and then we are like, oh, wow, okay, you know, let's uh, look into that. So, yeah, but um, I, I'm sure there's, after this, after Just Run Street, there's other things going to be coming up as well. So, you know, challenges for us, you know, let them come on. I think we are two years ahead. I always say the regulator's pressure is in our wake because we've already done that, been there 40 years of pressure. Challenges have become opportunities for us. We have, we're have making money because we've addressed some of these challenges. So, you know, it's really up to your organization to be proactive, get there, do it. You know, people ask me, where do we start? I said, you know, start with the little things you can. If you don't start doing a little, you will never know where the risks are, where the opportunities are. And I always say that 
Bursa's 11 common themes that you know has to be objectively um, measured now is amazing because it gives everyone somewhere to start and it's not difficult you know if you look at the indicators they are not difficult very straightforward the emissions yes and ways they have brought it forward to the following year because they're going to give us some time to get our act together but the rest of it you know corruption and you know uh, workers rights and all that is pretty straightforward corruption all they want to know is how many people you've bribed. <laughs> so count numbers, maybe today one, tomorrow another one, please you know, record it and then let them know. So this is what they want you to tell them, you know. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you yeah, but I think really that's, that's just a start, you know, disclosure really. But it does jolt, I, I have to say, it does jolt a lot of people into realisation yeah. how far away they are from, from the issue. But I think we don't really have to wait for him. We know investors are, are as I said, you know, consumers are voting with their, with their feet already. Investors are there. Maybe not so much in Malaysia. It's, starting, it's quite you know, slow here, uh, rather nascent. But it, it's, it's a matter of time. TCFD is coming by 2027. You have to do it. You're not going to get funding. You're not even, you might not even get in, uh, insurance if you don't do something now. You have to do something. You can't ignore it. It's going to affect Everyone, everyone, don't wait for someone to say something. You know it, don't wait. I mean, it's very Malaysian to wait. It's very Malaysian to wait till the regulator says something and force it. But yeah, so, 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 so we will have to do that, if, if you ask me. Um, because, you know, we're already behind. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so I think, you know, the, the, the Claren call has already been made for years, right? And, and if, if I have one thing to say now is to act now. And, and, and you know, act urgently, act now, you know, be agile and do, do everything now. You know, don't wait to be told. Thank you. Those are really good points. I think, you know, they have the 11 metrics here at Bursa and then we have the 27 core metrics in SGX. And, you know, there are a lot of these metrics that are coming forth from the regulators. And actually what's interesting is in Singapore, ACRA has just released public consultation for non-listed companies mm. to be subject to climate risk disclosures as well. And I think that that is the right thing to do because you've seen in New Zealand, for example, they also did that with the financial institutions. And when you have the regulator saying that you have to do this and it's mm. our duty to make you do that, that it does jog people into reality. Yeah. So with this, perhaps I can invite again your last opportunity to have maybe a reflection yes, or a question. Yes, the gentleman at the back. I'm Peter Yeo. I'm a retiree, nothing exciting. <laughs> so, but uh, what I'm trying to get at is this, you know. With regard to sustainability reporting, for example, if one spend a bit of time looking at the sustainability statements, from, uh, for those uh, applicable companies, I think one will find a lot of interesting uh, insights. You know? Because I ask this because very often when you mix, if you can go to seminars, seminars after seminars, you find that the bulk of the participants are actually coming from the professional support services sector. I've been mingling around, just wondering why they are uh, dominating in this area. Then you talk to one or two rare directors who happen to be around. When you talk about these things, they say, what? This sustainability statement, no, no borders, no fear. I got my consultant here, he has done everything, nothing much to worry about. Yeah. But the thing is, have, has the uh, authorities concerned uh, look at these sustainability statements and the things they say in these annual reports? Meaning, the early days of annual reports is only a couple of pages. Yeah. I remember uh, even in the UK, when they start to be serious about uh, this kind of reporting, suddenly you're talking about a few hundred pages long. And, and now it's already happening in this country. Look at the annual reports of all the listed companies. It's getting thicker, thicker and thicker. How many of us have the time to bother to read this? <coughs> Yeah. Isn't there any movement at all to prioritize on the key issues and the key impacts? We cannot be drowned by, bombarded by a huge, massive data until we lost track of what actually we are reading. Mm. Then the second point I want to ask is this. Uh, when we say about directors' uh, accountability and things like that, we are always thinking in the dimension of the big corporation, or at least at the minimum, the listed corporation. 
But then again, we hear from the policy makers, as well as from the regulators, including the Bursa Sam, for example, now they have got special disclosure platforms for such that SMEs can participate. Congra congratulations on that. That is a, a fine move. But if you look at uh, SMEs, for example, how many of them have a big board? Most of them have one or two directors board. Even the company stack provide for them to have a single directorship or they are into limited life, uh, LLPs and things like that. So when we say that we want the whole SME sector, I've been told time and again how much contribution they make and therefore how much they can contribute to the sustainability movement. But on the other hand, how, how is it that they are not very much involved? It, the best indicators you look at is the participation in all the seminars. How many SME entrepreneurs are on board here. Right, thank you very much for that question about sustainable reporting. So you are right, um, you know, sustainable reporting in Malaysia, Bursa man mandated it in 2015. And if you look at a, a lot of the reports, you know, a lot of them are doing it just for compliance of so very minimal, uh, a, a, you know, reporting. And but for those, you know, top 100, I told you they all like, you know, wanting to outbeat each other. So it's beautiful sustainable reporting. And it's you have to do it according to a framework. So GRI, you know, whatever. So now there's going to be a, a even uh, a standard format. It's coming up mandatory uh, overseas January 2024. And, you know, we can voluntarily adopt it in Malaysia if we so wish to, the IFRS 1 and 2. Uh, because at, only now, uh, Securities Commission, Bank Negara and all have set up a task force. So it'll be two years before they mandate it here. But the thing is, you know, because there is a standard format, uh, Mr. Yo, there is, you know, you've got to uh, tell us, you know, how your materiality assessment is done. How is it even linked to the Sustainable Development Goals, the 17 SDGs? Because, you know, in the UN, this wanted, you know, countries and organizations to make sure that everybody is brought on board inclusivity and you know sdg1 you know no poverty sdg2 uh, no hunger sdg13 uh, climate action sdg12 reduce consumption all this we have to see in our sustainability reporting because it is part of how you report it okay so but like you said, those who are not committed, give it to the consultant. They will come back with a beautiful report. But that's where directors are then accountable for what is in the report. If you don't go line by line and check, you know, you're going to get caught for greenwashing. Okay, so again, legal suits. Huh? So um, I think I've answered your first question. The second question was... On SMEs. SMEs. SMEs, well, we decided, you know, and I was shocked yesterday that, you know, there were so many, uh, we, we took a poll and most of the people in the room were SMEs because now the, the, the move is to help SMEs. We, in our organization, every year we have a sustainability consultation forum with our, our supply chain to make sure that, you know, they are there talking to us, we are encouraging them, we are persuading them because if we have to get to net zero, they are part of our supply chain, they have to also, you know, start looking at their emissions. So there's no running away and we really need to assist them because, you know, SMEs, as, as you know, you know, financially they are distraught. So, you know, really, if we can even help them financially, we have to because we want to be net zero and they're part of the supply chain. So I was so happy yesterday, for me it was eye opener as well. SSM is helping SMEs. Capital Markets and the Securities Commission is helping SMEs. Everybody is helping SMEs. So, you know, slowly, you know, in the last two years, the momentum is growing. So SMEs are also being, you know, helped financially. Uh, Melissa was telling me UOB has got, you know, financial instruments to help SMEs as well in Singapore. So, you know, I think uh, the momentum is great. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, just a quick one, Mr. Your latest Bursa Sustainability Reporting Framework, it's come a long way as well from 2015, yeah? It will actually, sh well, it doesn't shame. It names those who actually report uh, well. It tells you exactly how to report. Um, and, and for sure, you should not be relying on your consultants to do that. Um, it, it, it's all there. 
right? Um, and and really, Bursa does review the the, the report as well. Um, uh, the coming years, all companies as well, all PLCs will be given an ESG rating, not just those on the Irmas Index, right? So that's coming up as well. And there is a sustainability, there is a platform for everyone to disclose as well. Um, so, so there are various initiatives coming up, but to be fair, it's a fairly new area, but it's moving, it's moving very fast. Uh, things are there, so board members do need to really uh, uh, praise themselves or what's going on and keep keep alert to that. On SMEs as well, there's a lot of work. Really, if you're reporting on your scope threes alone, that's one of their scope ones probably. So there will already be there. But but there is a lot of help coming up for SMEs. I will say that in yesterday's conference, the CGM already says that. SSM is already saying that. Uh, there's a lot of funding, but a lot more can be done still, yes. Um, but, but yeah, it, it, it is there. I mean, it's coming up. One last thing, Mr. Yeo. We now have to provide assurance of our sustainable reporting well, as well. Okay? Well, that we don't have to, it's, but, it's but, but, but it's, it's yeah. not mandatory, it's not but mandatory. it's coming. Because as board members, you need to, to know that the data you have is reliable and accurate, right? Because you're accountable for it. So, uh, independence assurance of data is coming up. So, yeah. Um, the assurance, Jessica, I was at an internal audit uh, webinar where I was a panelist and, you know, they wanted me to, uh, to comment on the assurance. So I said, look, you know, internal audit can do the job. You know, you don't have to run to the big force and say, because they're going to charge you like crazy to do the assurance, external assurance, right? Start with internal assurance, you know, get your internal auditors to, you know, work along to see, you know, what you're doing on ESG uh, and then provide that assurance because at this moment in time, it's just voluntary uh, reporting uh, assurance uh, of your sister reporting. And then, you know, later, as it gets more and more uh, advanced, you may want to get external assurance, then, you know, if the internal audit cannot do the function, then by all means, you know, look for uh, uh, the big force to come in and charge you money. Thanks. Yeah, but this will also be addressed by the task force you mentioned uh, about assurance of uh, independent insurance of data. So rest assured, uh, regulators are looking at it. Yeah. yeah, just those are very good points. And just to add also the SGX, for example, has also made it a requirement for a group internal audit to look at sustainability reports. And as somebody who serves on two boards, I read the 250, 300 page report from beginning to end yeah. to ensure that everything in there is, is, is held accountable because the directors are directly liable. Yeah. So, yeah, so just to wrap up this conversation as we have to move to the next segment, Tan Shri, I want to hear your thoughts. I mean, a lot of things have been said about regulations, accountability, sustainability statements, and you yourself, you chair many organisations. If there's one piece of advice that you can give boards, senior management on how to really be effective on this issue, what would that be? Well, the board members have to educate themselves. That's uh, very obvious, you know, uh, more than the uh, senior management. But my concern is the still uh, apparent or perceived lack of awareness on ESG, in particular with the SME. Of course, as we have heard, there's a lot of interest and sympathy and support for SME, isn't it? But to what extent they would come forward and internalize that, I, I, I'm not sure. Uh, again, Chair, my concern is the democratization of knowledge here. Uh, many of these meetings are being held in Kuala Lumpur when there are other cities in the peninsula and Sabah and Sarawak. Secondly, it's still an elitist uh, pursuit for Malaysia. I, I, I can't say about Singapore, but in, in Malaysia, it's still an elitist one. You go to uh, Kuala Trunganu or Kota Baru, I'm not sure how much they know about uh, ESG, you know. So that is the challenge eventually for our country, you know. The message needs to be uh, spread out. And that message, very good now, there's a uh, heightened interest among the corporate sector, uh, but I think the, the message has to be spread out uh, more evenly. That is a very, very good point. It, in fact, it's also an English-dominated conversation. And, and therefore, we actually have, over the years, actually translated a lot of this content into local languages, vernacular languages, so that it can be shared and distributed. So that's a very good point. Thank you, Tanshree. Michelle, last words. 
Um, I've said it, I guess, a uh, word of advice, act now, be agile, have an open mindset, um, and never stop learning. And, and this is to board members, and, and actually to all of us, right? Um, yeah. Thank you. Kala. Well, there are not too many board members, so for the rest of us here, uh, like um, Jessica was saying yesterday, I said, you know, we are in the era of global boiling. Uh, what keeps me awake at night is the fact that, you know, scientists are measuring the CO2 levels in the atmosphere. The safe level is 350 parts per million. We are today in July with, you know, the Northern Hemisphere burning. It was 424 parts per million. Normally it's 419. So you can see, you know, from 350, we've already gone to 424. And at 600 parts per million, it's climate endgame or human extinction. So uh, I keep telling everybody, I used to say I was, I'm here to save the planet. I've stopped saying that. I'm here to save all of us, me included. And uh, yeah, so we need to act now. And Antonio Guterres says, do everything, you know, everywhere, all at once. And that's the only way we can, you know, maybe bring about a change. And we don't want a COVID-like uh, incident to happen where we are caught with our pants down, don't know what to do. So we've got time. Let's do it now so we can, you know, move yeah, and live in a beautiful, biodiverse uh, world. Thank you. Thank you very much for all your insights, the three of you. And if I have, uh, you know, encouragement to watch this program called Extrapolations. Anyone has seen it on Apple TV? It's basically a Hollywood A-list cast and it extrapolates what happens to our climate um, and our species in 2037, 2047, 2050. And it's quite sobering to actually watch, uh, you know, what happens when temperatures and wildfires and storms and extinction of animals happen. Um, not to depress you further, but it is also uplifting because they're personal stories of hope, personal stories of courage that really inspire action. And so I hope that, you know, this panel has been thought provoking. And so please join me to thank our panelists for this really insightful chat. And Thank you so much for your interaction as well. Thank you.